So I've, I've heard the question posed, you know, why is there so much emphasis on this new proposed principle that asks us to accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions? Why should we just focus on this one and not the others? Isn't it just as important to focus on the inherent worth and dignity in every person? Justice, equity, and compassion in human relations? How about acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations? Or a free and responsible search for truth and meaning? What about the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large? Then there's the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Of course, if we were fully living all of these principles, even fully living just one of them, the need for any additional principles would likely fade away. And yet clearly in the world at large, and even within our own homes and congregations, we remain aspirational at best. Paula Cole Jones is an activist, and she was a former UUA staff member. She noted that after working with congregations on issues of race and social justice for over 15 years, she realized that a person can believe that they are being a good UU and following the seven principles without thinking about or dealing with racism and other oppressions at the systemic level, she and others recognized that a corrective action was needed. For people identified as white, it is too easy to ignore these issues, which is exactly what keeps the system of racism in our society alive and in fact worsening, which we see every day. We need to decenter whiteness and other dominant cultures in the world as it relates to us, particularly to UUism. So the eighth principle came from a feeling that we need to renew our commitment to this work, to hold ourselves accountable, and to fulfill the potential of our existing principles. The events that took place in Buffalo barely a week ago serves to heighten the importance of this work. A racist, hate-filled action that was based on fear and ignorance resulted in the murder of 10 beautiful souls who died simply because of the color of mm. their skin. I mean, this is racism in its most blatant form a form of racism that is sadly being seen again and again. The hope of a post-racial world that was ushered in with the election of a black president has not yet materialized. In truth, the years since the election of President Obama have illuminated the depth of fear and ignorance that remains, as well as the unapologetic forces in our politics and public spaces that fuel this kind of fear. What happened in Buffalo last week, in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, Pittsburgh, PA in 2018, Indianapolis, Indiana in 2021. What happened to George Floyd, Amrit Aubrey, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, and what happened to these people and so many others is what many people often think of as racism. But we do know that as horrible and harmful as these acts of racism are, just as harmful and perhaps even more insidious are the ways in which this country has been built from its very inception on systems that have had the oppression of others built into the very fabric of our daily lives. 
Systemic racism is so embedded in our daily life that it's often assumed that this is reflecting the natural inevitable order of things, such as systems that impose and sustain barriers that promote good health and well-being, things like access to good jobs with benefits, safe, unpolluted neighborhoods with good schools, high quality health care, the ease of the right to vote, fair treatment in the criminal justice system, the list can go on. And if you live a life like I live, that does, hasn't touched me in a personal way. But if I walk outside my doors in the city of York, this is everywhere. And it's heavy stuff, isn't it? It's hard to hear. It's hard to think about. And yet facing the hard is what is before us at this time. So I think that it's, we can see the importance of the proposed eighth principle. And I know that the members of this congregation understood this when you voted to adopt this principle almost four years ago. You all were the 11th congregation to sign on to this principle. So the questions that I posed earlier for today are, how has the adoption of this principle changed your life? What are you doing differently than you did before? How has this faith community changed as a result of adopting this pledge? And what more do we need to do to more fully live into this declaration? We signed it, so now what? So I'm going to ask you to take a few moments to let those first couple of questions settle in. How has the adoption of this principle changed your life? What are you doing differently than you did before? And for those of you who have joined the community since UUG adopted the eighth principle, what, if anything, has this meant to you? Were you even aware of it? So just think about that for a moment. And now I'd like to just share a little bit of my journey as I've been stepping, walking, moving more fully into what it means to dismantle racism, dismantle oppressions. So the reading that Sally did earlier it really resonated with me because I could have easily been the woman that Dr. Wright outspoke of. I remember so clearly mentally changing the words to that song in a similar fashion. I had a deep feeling that we need to claim more love right now, right here, that such a proclamation would help to manifest more love in the world now instead of putting it off to some far off time and place. And while I wasn't the person that Dr. Rideout spoke of, I did express such thoughts in another group. And I had the uncomfortable gift of some loving pushback that expressed essentially what Dr. Rideout did. And at that time, it did not occur to me to consider the perspective of those who created this experience. I was so self-centered that I wasn't aware of how other people who didn't have a similar experience to mine might see the world. You don't know what you don't know. And when you do enter into places where others disabuse you of closely held notions, it can be awkward, it can be embarrassing. And like many of us, I don't like to feel awkward. I don't want to do things that will result in embarrassment. I don't want to say or do the wrong thing. But what I am very certain of is that the world as it is constructed right now has got to change. And systemic racism is a sin that has been at the center of our most beloved ideals since the origins of this country. Black folks were considered three-fifths of a person for economic reasons. You know, we declare we, you know, equality, happiness, the pursuit of happiness for everyone, and that has not been the case. 
And those who identify as white, those who have benefited from harm done, and, and benefited in ways that you may not even have been aware that you were benefiting because this is just the way life was. Those who identify as white, those who have benefited from the harm done to our black and brown siblings need to do all that can be done to change the course of that poisonous beginning. And much of what that means is listening to the voices of those on the margins, those oppressed by such systems. Listen, amplify, educate yourself, lend support, but especially listen. During my internship, I worked to bring the Beloved Conversations program to that congregation and help to facilitate it. Beloved Conversations is a program for Unitarian Universalists seeking to embody racial justice as a spiritual practice with the intention to heal the impact of racism in our lives in order to get free together. So the attendees of this program happened to be all middle-aged or older white women, and there were times when some of them said, you know, I don't think I can say anything to anybody anymore. This response came particularly after one session that focused on microaggressions, and you know, maybe you're all familiar with that and maybe you're not, but microaggressions are those indirect, subtle, often unintentional remarks and actions that communicate some kind of bias towards marginalized groups. Um, I mean, there's a million examples. You can Google it and find examples of microaggressions, but there are things that <laughs> can be done so innocently but have an impact far beyond what the intention of saying those words were. So the, the women in this group were coming to a conclusion that they didn't want to say or do the wrong thing, so maybe it would be better to just not say or do anything, which they concluded that really wasn't the answer either. So yeah, doing this work on a personal basis asks us to confront ourselves, our closely held notions, our good intentions, and ways of being in the world ways that can feel uncomfortable and awkward at times. But the hope is that once we know better, we do better. For me, this journey is one of opening myself to humility, to curiosity, to grace and humor. And I'm grateful for those people in my life who continually teach me. I read as much as I can from people who are doing this work I watch movies in ways that, um, to inform me of things that I, I was not aware of. I take part in listening circles. And I recognize that this is work that is going to last my lifetime. So there was a second set of questions that I posed this morning, which are how has the UUG, how has UUG as a faith community changed since the adoption of this principle? And what more do we need to do to more fully live into this declaration? So I wasn't here when this principle was adopted, so I'm gonna to have to rely on you all to um, help to answer this question. But what I have observed, what has changed since UUG adopted this principle, I'm aware of the conscious attention paid to the structure of the worship service to incorporate voices of our black and brown siblings each week into our services through the Blue Notes. And in working closely with the worship team, I know that there is an intention to regularly bring speakers into the pulpit who address the desire to dismantle racism and other oppressions through their words, through poetry, through music, and through their very beingness. I know that Betty Baker has been doing much with members of the faith and community team to create a pledge to end racism. And this pledge, you've heard some about it, you'll hear much more about it as it, it moves along. But this pledge will strive to bring a focus to each of us regarding the importance of this work through deepening relationships with community partners, 
through education and outreach. So make sure you stay tuned for more information about that. And I, I've heard that there are plans afoot to organize a bus trip to the National Museum of African American History and Culture this fall. So ways to educate ourselves, ways to do it as a community, ways to bring a change in our hearts, our minds, and, and how we operate in the world. So I'm going to just ask, are there things that I've missed that anybody here or on um, Zoom are aware of? I'll just pause a minute to see if there's anything that you can think of. Anything from Zoom, Chris? OK. So the last question I posed was, what more do we need to do to fully live into this declaration? And I know that there are lists upon lists of resources. There are so many good books from lots of different perspectives, white fragility, hearing different people's stories. Um, and they can help you to become more educated about this. <laughs> and we know that Gettysburg is a small town. It leans to the conservative side, and there's not a tremendous amount of diversity in, in Gettysburg. And we know that the midterm elections have Pennsylvania playing a pivotal role this year in many, many ways. So something to very much engage in is to think about how you're going to be a part of the election cycle this fall. Other things to consider, continue educating yourself in the many ways that structural racism impacts your life and the lives of others, even if you are not fully familiar with what that means. Do some research. Especially important is to partner with others already doing this work, whether it's through the YWCA, the NAACP, or many other organizations, listening circles, circles of care. There's lots of, of people that are doing this work, but do it with others. Make it a priority. Speak out in large and small settings. When you're in family gatherings and somebody makes those jokes, you know, rather than laughing along, just say, ooh, huh, that kind of hit me the wrong way. You know, when you're in a public place, and it, it takes courage, it takes a willingness to get some of that pushback, but those are the real ways that we can begin to affect change. And as I noted before, support those running for elected office who understand the importance of dismantling racism and other oppressions. And perhaps most importantly, create and deepen relationships with those who look different than you do. We need each other more than we know. And we have to know each other to really grasp the importance of that. So I'm going to echo Dr. Rideout. When we inhabit the music, the forms of expression of people who live their lives along the margins of notice, we must notice that we have entered holy ground, a sacred space of learning, a sacred space of relationship. This is truly holy work. We know the world is changing through it. May we be co-creators of a new world. And with that, you are invited to listen to the hope-filled music of Leah Morris. <laughs> 